Morning, everyone. We've got two readings today. The first is on page 309 of your church Bibles. It's 1 Chronicles 12, 8 to 22. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the wilderness. They were brave warriors, ready for battle, and able to handle the shield and spear. Their faces were the faces of lions, and they were as swift as gazelles in the mountains. Ezra was the chief, Obadiah the second in command, Eliab the third, Mismanah the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Atai the sixth, Eliel the seventh, Joanan the eighth, Elzabad the ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, Mikbenai the eleventh. These Gadites were army commanders. The least was a match for a hundred, and the greatest for a thousand. It was they who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks, and they put to flight everyone living in the valleys, to the east and to the west. Other Benjamites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold. David went out to meet them and said to them, If you have come to me in peace to help me, I am ready for you to join me. But if you have come to betray me to my enemies, when my hands are free from violence, may the God of our ancestors see it and judge you. Then the spirit came, to, came on Amasai, chief of the 30, and he said, we are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success, success to you and success to those who help you, for your God will help you. So David received them and made them leaders of his raiding bands. Some of the tribe of Manasseh defected to David when he went with the Philistines to fight against Saul. He and his men did not help the Philistines because after consultation, their rulers sent him away. They said, it will cost us our heads if he deserts to his master Saul. When David went to Ziklag, these were the men of Manasseh who defected to him. Adna, Jozebad, Jediel, Michael, Jozebad, Elihu, and Zilatai leaders of units of a thousand in Manasseh. They helped David against raiding bands, for all of them were brave warriors, and they were commanders in the army. Day after day, men came to help David until he had a great army like the army of God. Then our second reading is on page 849 of the Church Bibles. It's Romans 5, verse 6 to 11. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very, very much, Natasha. And good morning. Um, if I've not met to you, my name's Andy. I'm the minister here at, at CCV. And didn't you do brilliantly on those lists of names? Um, I'm ready to screw them up. Um, so if there's not a complete tally, um, we'll, we'll probably go with Natasha's pronunciation. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us, particularly if you're uh, guests of the Ratcliffe's or the Brioners families. Um, it's wonderful to have you. And we're in the middle of this series looking at this book of Chronicles, which is a retelling of uh, Israel's history. And it's got a lot to say for us today. Uh, whether we call ourselves the Christians or whether we're just here today looking in on Christian things. So what I'd love you to do is open up your Bibles and keep them open on uh, page 309. And I want you to follow along with me and make sure that what I'm saying is what it says here. And um, it's quite hot today, isn't it? And you can, you can, that's what this is for. This is a service sheet. It can do two things. One, you can, uh, you can write notes down if that helps you keep awake. Two, it can fan. So we think of everything here at CCB. Um, so make use of that um, one way or another. Fantastic. One well, I pray. 
Lord God, we praise you for already those testimonies we've heard today, for what you've done in Len's life, what you've done in uh, the Ratcliffe's lives. What we pray, Lord, you'll continue to do in Ethan's life. Uh, But Lord, I pray that whoever we are here this morning, we would leave this morning thinking most of all about Jesus, the King. Help us understand why it is worth following him and joining him. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. On October the 21st, 1967, a rather ordinary looking 41-year-old woman stepped off an airplane. This was uh, at JFK Airport in LA. Ordinary woman. And yet, as soon as she got off the plane, she was surrounded by photographers and paparazzi trying to take photo of her. She wasn't a celebrity. Uh, She wasn't a film star. She wasn't a politician. She was, in fact, Joseph Stalin's daughter, who had defected to the United States, the most famous defector during the Cold War. She later said in interviews that she defected because she no longer believed in communism. It simply didn't live up to its grand claims. She described the Soviet system as profoundly corrupt. She denounced her father as a moral and spiritual monster, And having publicly burned her Soviet passport, she looked forward to what citizenship in the United States would bring her. Freedom is what she said. Defection always makes for a good story, doesn't it? And and I think that's particularly true even in in, uh, popular media. Perhaps you've uh, been following the Star Wars universe. You'll know this guy behind me, uh, Finn. He's the the stormtrooper who decides to defect from the Empire to join the Rebel Alliance. Why? Well, for him, the big big push factor was seeing the the brutality of the Empire. That's why he defected. Or maybe you recognize this guy from the Harry Potter universe, uh, uh, Severus Snape. He defects from Voldemort to join the Order of the Phoenix. Why? Well, for him, the big pull factor was his great love for Lily Potter. It always takes great courage to defect, to leave everything which you know behind, to join something new. But having weighed the cost, each of these people considered it worthwhile. Now, I'll begin with that because in a very real sense, both Len and the Ratcliffe family are defectors. Because they're people who've switched teams, people who have transferred allegiances. In fact, we could go further and say that every single Christian, every single follower of Jesus in this room is a defector. Because as we heard earlier from uh, our confession, we're people who've been transferred from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning, maybe, and you're first time ever at church, perhaps, and you're looking in on Christian things, perhaps your friends with the Brioneses or the Ratcliffs, you'd be right to be wondering, why? Why on earth would they be defecting? I mean, what were the push factors? I mean, what was life before really that bad? And also, what are the pull factors? What's so great about Jesus? If I was you, those would be the questions I'll be wondering. Well, here's the thing. 1 Chronicles 12 is really going to help us answer these questions because it describes the defection of various soldiers to David's side from King Saul's side. Now, at the time, people would have looked at these defectors' decisions and thought it was a terrible decision. What are you doing? David's in the wilderness, hiding in a cave. He doesn't look like much of a winner, does he? But the chronicler, he's retelling this story 700 years after the the event. And he proves that their defection was very wise indeed. Because his readers, the chronicler's readers, they had also recently defected. They had defected from Babylon, where they're in exile. They have now returned back to the promised land. And he wants his generation, now they're back in the land, now they have defected. He wants his generation to unite together, to unite under the hope of a coming future king. 
So let's dive in and let's meet the defectors who are, incidentally, anything but defective. Look at verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1, page 309, if you close your Bibles. It says this. These were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. Now, the chronicler, he kind of assumes we kind of know the story here. Um, but of course, most of us probably don't know the story. So allow me to do a little bit of a recap. A few years before the events in this chapter, David was one of Saul's most trusted generals. After all, as you may know, David was, was the one who, who fought Goliath when no one else would. And David was the one who, who won all these battles against the Philistines when no one else could. So for a while, Saul loved David. But then his jealousy kicked in. As a result of all his great successes, David became very popular with the people. And so Saul kind of grew paranoid that, that David was trying to usurp him and get him off the throne, even though all the while David was absolutely loyal. So in his madness, Saul turns on David and repeatedly tries to have him killed, which means for years and years, David is running around the wilderness, hiding in caves, sleeping rough, fearing for his life. So this scene in verse 1, if you look down, notice it takes place in Ziklag, which as you can see from uh, this map behind me, is deep in enemy territory in Philistia. Meanwhile, Saul and his army are camped way up north in Jezreel. Saul's about to engage the Philistines in in one last battle, which would decide the the great war with the Philistines. And, And it's at this critical juncture that these men defect to David. But who are they? Who are these defectors, we might ask? Well, again, carry on with me. Verse one, look down. They were among the warriors who helped David in battle. They were armed with bows and were able to shoot arrows or to sling stones right-handed or left-handed. They were relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. That's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? The 23 men who defected were members of Saul's own family. Some of them were even from Saul's hometown in Gibeah. So more than anybody else, these guys, they they would have known Saul the best, which is perhaps why they defected to David on the eve of this battle. But they're not the only surprise defection, are they? In verse 8, if you look down, we read of 11 more men who switch sides. Verse 8, follow with me. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the wilderness. They were brave warriors, ready for battle and able to handle the shield and spear. Their faces were the faces of lions, not literally. And they were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. And then we're given the names, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Verse 14, these Gadites were army commanders. The least of them were a match for a hundred and the greatest For a thousand, perhaps a little bit of hyperbole there. It was they who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks, and they put to flight everyone living in the valleys to the east and to the west. Now, as you can see from this map, the surprising thing about these defectors is the distance they traveled. The tribal region of Gad is miles away from where David is in the wilderness. So to join him, they would have to cross the river Jordan in flood season. Which, as you can see from this image, is no picnic. It's it's a nightmare. Imagine trying to cross that in in a primitive raft wearing heavy armor. Would you be up for that? White water rafting in those conditions? I don't think so. But these 11 guys looked at Saul, looked at David and went, yeah, worth it. Begs the question, doesn't it? Why are David's former enemies risking their lives to join him? We might come up with some ideas. Could it be they couldn't quite cut it in Saul's army? 
they kind of had to opt for David's B team. Is that an option? Could it be that they were a little bit afraid of fighting the Philistines up north, and so they sort of ran away because they, they wanted to hide in a cave with David? Is, is that the reason? Could these defectors be defective? Similarly, I, I guess if you're here this morning looking in on, on Christian things, you might well wonder, is there something defective about Len? Besides the obvious. <laughs> are, are the Ratcliffs just a little bit afraid of and scared of the real world? And a lot of people dismiss Christianity on these grounds, don't they? They say, oh, Christianity, it's a, it's a crutch for the weak. Or as Karl Marx once said, it's, it's an opiate for the masses to help dull the pain of life. Well, looking at the defectors again in this passage, the last word I'd use to describe them is weak. <laughs> the 23 Benjamites were an ambidextrous artillery unit, lethal at long range with both the bow and the sling. And the 11 Gadites were as a fast and ferocious close combat unit, lethal with the shield and with the spear. The Chronicle is laying it on, isn't it? He's at pains to emphasize that they defected not because they're weak, but rather because they realized that their great strength was not sufficient to save them. They realized that Saul, and if you know anything about Saul, he was a giant of a man, huge. But they looked at Saul and they like, he is not sufficient to lead us, to save us. They looked at David in weakness, hiding in a cave. And they thought, this is the guy. I'm going to throw my lot in with him. See, that's why they crossed the waters to get to him. There's a tendency in each of us, isn't there? I don't know if you've noticed this about yourself. There's a tendency in each of us to take our strengths, whatever they, they might be, I don't know what you say your strengths are, uh, and then invest in them a, a burden of expectation that they, they cannot possibly bear. Uh, so we might expect our strengths to uh, give us a sense of identity or purpose or security. So I don't know, again, what you'd say your strengths are. I asked uh, uh, Len and, and the Ratcliffs this week what theirs were. Andy uh, shared with me how he used to look to his education. He's a rocket scientist, if you don't know. Uh, Laura used to look to her job title and the status it brought her. Uh, Len has already shared this morning how he used to look to his morality. I'm a good guy. <laughs> but these great strengths, they cannot secure us. They, they cannot save us. Perhaps like these men who defected from Saul's own family. It sometimes takes a while, doesn't it, to see that the king that we have, the king that we have is not the king that we need. The reason that Len and Ethan are later going to cross the waters of baptism to defect to Jesus is because they know their own strengths are not sufficient to save them. Only Jesus, only Jesus, David's greatest descendant, can do that. So having met the defectors, let's now go on and meet the king. Let's meet the king who is mercifully receptive. Now, of course, I say king. At this point in the story, David isn't yet king. But notice how he displays the most extraordinary grace and mercy to these enemies who, who come to him. Uh, pick it up, verse 16, if you would. Have you got a Bible? Verse 16. Other Benjaminites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold. David went out to meet them and said to them, If you've come to meet me in peace to help me, I'm ready for you to join me. But if you've come to betray me to my enemies when my hands are free from violence, may the God of our ancestors see it and judge you. Now we can perhaps understand David's sense of caution here, can't we? He spent years on the run, hiding in caves, hiding in the wilderness, and all the while evading Saul's various different traps and, and attempts on his life. 
By contrast, on the other hand, David had plenty of opportunities to assassinate Saul. He deliberately chose not to take them. He wanted to keep his hands free from guilt, free from sin. But but now all of a sudden, these guys arrive at his camp from Saul's own family. Seems a bit suspicious, doesn't it? Seems a bit convenient. And so we can't blame David for suspecting that they might have ulterior motives, that they might be a Trojan horse. But David doesn't give in to his paranoia. Instead, David chooses to be merciful to Saul's men. He trusts that if they have evil motives, God would expose them. But what David does is an incredible risk. David risks welcoming these former enemies into his camp. Now, I doubt as they arrive through the doors, I doubt enemy is a label which they would have owned for themselves. But to David, that's, that is what they were. It kind of reminds me of that Mitchell and Webb sketch. I don't know if you like Mitchell and Webb. Um, one of my favourite sketch guys. And um, it's a great sketch where they're playing two Nazi officers in uh, the trenches of World War II. And in their boredom, they begin sort of looking at their uniform and sort of investigating a bit. And one of the guys takes off his hat and says, have you noticed that our caps have skulls on them? Why skulls? Hands, are we the baddies? It's a brilliant sketch, absolutely brilliant, because... We're so used to thinking of ourselves as the goodies, aren't we? In the stories that we tell of ourselves, we're always the hero or the victim. We're never the offender. We're never the baddie. But the Bible's description of each of us is not not as flattering. We heard in our second reading, didn't we? How we're described as, as being, by nature, God's enemies. Now that's a strong word, isn't it? Again, you might not say to yourself, I'm God's enemy, but we perhaps like to think of ourselves as neutral. We're neutral. But just think again. You see, our creator made us to enjoy life under his loving rule. And, And he's lavished on each of us, hasn't he? So many good things. He's given us our educations. He's given us our careers. He's given us our families. He's given us our backgrounds. He's he's given us so many good things. But our response universally is to take those good things, take those strengths, and then live for them instead. Worship them instead of the God who gave them to us. Uh, these things then end up ruling us, often to our detriments, instead of our creator. So no, nobody this morning is disputing that, that uh, we can be moral people or educated people or cultured people. We're not Philistines. But these strengths cannot save us just as these men realized that their strengths could not save them. And on our own, we, as we see from this passage, we, we are powerless sinners, ungodly enemies of the true king. And yet, and yet that true king reaches out the hand and is mercifully receptive of us. Because it was when we were still powerless that Christ died for the ungodly. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. It was while we were God's enemies that we were reconciled to him. Now the chronicler, he was retelling this account 700 years after the event. Longing for another great king like David to come along. But it will be another 400 years when Jesus Christ would arrive. And looking at his life, if you ever read one of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, looking at his life, he, he was like a greater David. He was totally blameless. There was no blood on his hands, no sin on his hands or his conscience. It's what makes, makes him so remarkably attractive. And yet, like David, he was hated. He was hounded by those he came to save. Ultimately, 
Jesus was nailed to a cross. He was wearing a crown of thorns. And there's a little sign above his head which said, this is the king of the Jews. Mockingly inviting anyone to look at Jesus and go, you want to defect to this guy? You want to throw your lot in with this guy? Really? But his death was not a tragic accident. But his own deliberate plan. I don't know if you ever understood this, but Jesus Christ died in order to save us from our sin. From our own rejection of him. You see, we are the ones who deserve to die. We are the ones who deserve to be cut off from God. For we behave as his enemies. And yet, upon the cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, switched places with us. The Son of God became the enemy of God. In order that we enemies of God might be adopted into God's family. And baptism later on is is a picture of this. Uh, Later you're going to see uh, Len going down to the waters and being raised back up. It's a picture of dying with Christ. And it's not the end of the story. Later, being raised with Christ. So is Jesus simply a, a crutch for the weak? No. He's much more than that. He is a defibrillator to pump life into dead bodies. He is a life support machine, which alone through which we can have breath. Jesus is much more. He is our peace, without whom we would be left as enemies of God. So how should we respond to this king's merciful reception of us? Well, I think in verse 18, we're given a great example in this guy called Amasai. Look at verse 18. Then the spirit came on Amasai, or literally in the Hebrew, the spirit clothed himself with Amasai, chief of the 30. And he said, we are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success, success to you. Success to those who help you. For your God will help you. It's brilliant, isn't it? Because Amasai realizes David isn't some just a great rescuer, a great soldier against the Philistines. He's also a king. So to follow him means not just accepting that the free rescue, it means also living under his rule. Uh, later on, um, or well, in fact, earlier on, um, we, well, yeah, later, the baptism is later, isn't it? I'm confused. Later on, we're going to hear uh, Len and, and the Ratcliffs make sim- very similar promises to Amasai here. We are yours. We belong to you. We are with you. We are for you. And just as the the Holy Spirit clothed Amasai to say those words, well, so the Spirit clothes anyone who would come to him, to trust in him. Now, I know absolutely nothing about football, so this week Andy's been giving a little little bit of an education about soccer. And um, apparently it's really common in football for, for players to transfer from one team to another for vast sums of money. So, for example, Raheem Sterling uh, has spent the last seven years at Man City, where he was their top try scorer. But then, but then this week, uh, he, was, uh, he was transferred. He was transferred to, uh, to Chelsea, where I gather he's going to get to wear a brand new kit. Now, that, that, change of, that transfer to a new team, it kind of necessitates a change of behavior for Raheem, doesn't it? He can't rock up to his Man City games uh, sorry, his Chelsea games, still wearing the, the strip of the Man, Man City, can he? That'd be inappropriate. Nor, in his games against Man City, can he score goals against Chelsea? Because that's his team. He switched sides. His allegiances have changed. Well, well as Christ died upon the cross, it's as, if he, it's as if he paid a vast sum of money that you might join his team. And in him, we are now clothed with a new kit. We are clothed with the Holy Spirit. Which means uh, Len and and the Ratcliffe, they're not free to carry on living however they like because they're wearing Jesus' kit. And that means they've got a new priority. 
They make it their priority now to help the purposes of his kingdom. I don't know if you noticed that wonderful little detail at the end of verse 18. I love it. When David welcomes these men, he immediately makes them leaders in his raiding band. So he, what, what, what would you have done if these enemies defected to you? Well, we might have been tempted to maybe place them in the bottom ranks and make them sort of prove themselves uh, over the course of time. Or maybe we would have given them really grotty jobs, cleaning out the latrines or something like that as penance for their former allegiance. David does neither of those. He makes them leaders, officers. And so it is with Jesus Christ. When someone defects to his side, even the smallest boy like Ethan, he bestows, he bestows upon them the greatest rank of all, which is a child of the living God. There's nothing to earn. There's no penance to pay. Jesus paid for it all upon the cross. So again, maybe your question is, okay, I like Len and I like the Ratcliffe family, but what is this church thing that they seem to be mysteriously suddenly into? What is this about? Well, finally, and most briefly, let's learn about the kingdom, which is a united collective. So over the page, flip over the page with me to verse 23. And uh, this uh, kind of picks up the story at a much later point. Verse 23. These are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him, as the Lord had said. Now, if you've been with us throughout this series, you'll know that Saul actually died in that fateful battle up north against the Philistines. And everyone fighting under Saul was defeated with him. Which meant that, with hindsight, that these defectors who moved over to David's side, they're they kind of vindicated in their decision, aren't they? David is now the obvious person to take over as king of Israel. And so later at Hebron, which you can see on the map, uh, David is crowned king by all Israel. And uh, in these verses, as you look down, we're, we're kind of given this list of the armies of the 12 tribes who then came to support him. And surprisingly, it's, it's not just the southern tribes of Judah and Simeon and Levi, but it's the northern tribes as well. And even the Transjordan tribes, the tribes that are across the river. And even, verse 29, Benjamin, which we're reminded was Saul's tribe. So as you can see from, from this map, that their different tribal allotments were incredibly dispersed which meant as a people, they were incredibly diverse. And yet, we are told they together gave undivided loyalty to David with a whole heart. This is remarkable because under King Saul, Israel never enjoyed anything like this level of unity. The various tribes were always squabbling with one another. They always sort of even at civil war with one another. And Saul liked to play favorites and play them off against one another in order to get his own way. But David is the first king who manages to take these dispersed and diverse 12 tribes and make them one united kingdom. As I've been preparing this week, it kind of reminded me of the Night's Watch. I don't know if you read the, the Game of Thrones books or perhaps you saw the TV show. But the Night's Watch were this band of soldiers who defended the wall, uh, which protects the realm of men from the realm of evil up north. And, and, and they call one another brothers, for they are a family uh, to one another. And yet, if you read the books, you'll know they're utterly diverse in their makeup. Uh, some of them were born as lords. Others of them were, were commoners. Some of them were, were rapists and, and criminal offenders. And yet... Here they are, and they get a new start, serving with honor in a, in a variety of, of different ways. And so it is with Christ and his kingdom. Through faith in him, we, 
we believe we are forgiven sinners. We're all adopted into the same family. And together, shoulder to shoulder, we serve the purposes of the kingdom in different ways. Len talks about shifting chairs around. He's a pro at that. He really is. We have different gifts, different abilities, and, and yet we're serving the same king. And that's exactly the same in David's day. Just, just look how the passage ends in verse 38. All these were fighting men who volunteered to serve in the ranks. They came to Hebron fully determined, literally, of undivided heart to make David king over all Israel. All the rest of the Israelites were also of one mind to make David king. The men spent three days there with David, eating and drinking, for their families had supplied provisions for them. Also, their neighbors from as far away as Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali came bringing food on donkeys, camels, mules, and oxen. There were plentiful supplies of flour, fig cakes, raisin cakes, wine, olive oil, cattle, sheep, for there was joy in Israel. Do you get a sense of the unity, the joy? It's like the same party we're going to be having later on, isn't it? Has anyone bought fig cakes? I don't know. I remember when um, Len first came to CCB, and he mentioned it a moment ago. He was literally sitting at the back with his arms crossed, looking grumpy, um, and uh, you know, wondering what. None of these people are like me. And I remember him, like when we were singing, he was looking around, going, "Why are they singing?" And afterwards, uh, people were just weirdly friendly. Why are they so friendly? What's their angle? You know, he was wondering this. And yet, as we've heard, something about the person of Jesus Christ attracted him. Something about the, the generous mercy of Jesus Christ changed him. And now Len enjoys being part of this diverse family. And he belts out the songs with the rest of us. And we're going to enjoy this party next door without raisin cakes. He says, isn't it good? Not all Christians are the same. And that's a good thing. Because it shows that the king mercifully welcomes anyone who comes to him. You might be here this morning saying, the things I've done in my past, he wouldn't want me. I'm too much of an enemy. No, think again. You might be thinking, I'm from too far away. I'm from miles away, different culture, different background. Jesus isn't for me. Think again. As I close, can I invite you to be like the men from the tribe of Issachar? In verse 32, I love these guys. We're told, verse 32, the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Perhaps you're here this morning for the first time or maybe for the hundredth time and you know what you should do. You understand that the time is right for you to recognize Jesus as your king and to stop trying to live for other things instead. Perhaps you know what you should do and defect to the true king. I'm now going to pray a prayer and I'm going to invite you, if you'd like to, in the quietness of your own heart, to to pray it with me. Uh, I've got it up on the screen uh, behind me uh, so you can follow along. Um. But it might be that today you want to say, yes, I do want to follow Jesus as my king. Yes, I do want to make him my my savior. Let's bow our heads and let me pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that I am not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. I'm sorry and I need your forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me so that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen.
Amen. If you prayed that prayer, perhaps for the first time, don't do what Len did and not tell anyone. Come and chat with me. Come and chat with whoever it is who brought you today, invited you today, because we'd love to help you on the next steps. I'm going to hand back over to Tom.